Okay. All right. So let's get started. I'm sure some folks will probably be like filtering in a little bit later, but it's fine. My name is Mahdi Mohammed. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Um, yes, yeah, good evening. <laughs> Hope everyone is, you know, feeling well and I don't know, just rested and good. And um, this is a good space. East New York Farms is an amazing community organization. I've worked with them before. Um, they just always offer me community. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here again. So without further ado, <laughs> I'm a fashion designer. I also name myself a fabric alchemist. Um, reason being that, of course, like the actual process of alchemy, which is transforming one material into another. Um, that is something I've learned to do with fabric, where I take discarded clothing that is either 100% cotton, linen, or wool, and I transform the discarded items into something new. So I'll give you an example. I might go to like a Salvation Army, a Goodwill, or a thrift store and grab like five to six men's cotton t-shirts and then turn that into like a dress or like a pair of sweatpants or like um, a jacket or something like that. Um, and the reason being that fabrics also have a vibrational frequency. All things that are living have vibrational frequencies um, and fabrics do have a range. So linen, wool, and cotton and organic cotton have a higher vibrational frequency than that of polyesters and some other materials. We'll get into a little bit of that, like the history of that, the research that I have on that later. But just giving you the intro, that is what um, I do. I started when I was about 11 years old. I was making my doll clothes out of socks. Um, <laughs> and my mom would have a bag of clothing she was gonna send to like a Salvation Army or Goodwill. And she would kind of tell me if I wanted anything from the bag to sort of like create with or make my clothes, my doll clothes with, then I could go in the bag first and get like first dibs. And then I would take something and just turn it into um, clothing somehow. So that that grew, of course, you know, as children, we're really creative. My brother and I used to do things like make race car tracks out of cereal boxes, like just, you know, and I watched Zoom a lot. So that was a big part of my childhood and growing up. Um, but that has continued into adulthood now where I've just grown the practice and grown the skills. Self-taught, didn't go to school for fashion or sewing. Um, and just after over time and over the years, I've just progressed it and gotten really good with it, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. And so I would like to share just like, I wrote down some notes just so I can like stay focused. <laughs> um, but when I first started designing, I didn't start out with only using cotton, linen, and wool. I kind of just would design with whatever I could get my hands on, right? So whatever was accessible to me. Um, and then of course, when I got my first job and I was working in like public relations, I really would just go to fabric stores in New York and just buy fabric that looked cool or like interesting. You know, bright colors was what I tended to go for. Bold prints, abstract um, designs, that kind of thing. Not really paying much attention to um, where like the fabric was coming from, what it was made of, its contents, any of that. So that went on, I wanna say probably up until 2019. And then I think 2019 is when the pandemic happened, right? Yeah, so prior, right before the pandemic happened, I traveled to the island of Barbados and um, I pretty much did a residency there for three months. When I was there on the island, I spent a lot of time obviously in natural resources, um, walking to the beach every morning at 5 a.m. to swim, um, just being around the people, like fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, going to the markets every day, that kind of thing. And then being honored and um, privileged to work with one of the elders on the island, his name was Adalabu, and he was a loom artist. So loom work is essentially how fashion starts. You know, it's like the fabric starts there. You get um, cotton from the plant or you get the flax from the plant and then it gets turned into the actual thread and then that gets turned into the actual fabric. So he invited me to his studio and I got to see him working and that completely changed my understanding and idea of like the origins of fashion, where things start and how they go. Uh, I grew more respect for the practice and immediately just wanted to dive deeper into that whole world of like natural resources, right? So while I was there on the island, there was like one or two fabric stores and one of the artists wanted to do a collaboration with me. And the funny thing is, um, 
I just was like, felt, I felt really limited because I was so used to just being in New York and being able to go to these fabric stores that had this plethora of options. But it's not really that you're limited. It's just that you're more resourceful when you're in a place like that. You know what I mean? And you almost forget and take for granted how much is at your disposal in countries like um, the USA, right? So anyway, we went to the fabric store. I was supposed to be grabbing fabric for the collection. And while I was there, I just realized like there were so many polyesters and stretch this and stretch that and lycras and spandexes. And I was like, let's just keep this really simple. The artist was a painter. So I was like, let me just get something that's similar to canvas that you can paint on, like, you know, the clothing. So I was going for organic cotton, cotton and linen at the time. And I was like, we're on the island, it's hot. So it needs to be breathable, right? So I ended up grabbing those fabrics. And then with that, I just would create simple, really simple silhouettes, like an A-line skirt or like a top that ties in the back or oversized pants that can be like adjusted, you know, to be worn multiple ways, that kind of thing. Um, but still breezy, airy, comfortable things that you can wear on the island. And then uh, the artist painted on them and then we did an exhibit. So flash forward, I came back to the States and I was thinking I was just gonna come back and, you know, dive back into doing everything. I was teaching in Harlem at the time, I was teaching high school or sewing and fashion. And when I got back, the pandemic hit. <laughs> So they shut down the schools, they shut down everything, as you all remember. Um, it was a trying time for everybody, but what I ended up doing was sort of going within and just going deeper into that research of what was pulling me towards working with more natural materials, right? So I started doing my research, um, I got heavier into it. And then while I was home, I decided to do a collection only using linen, wool, and a fabric called Lysol. And I got a gift to take back to the States with me from the elder I mentioned who was on the island. He sent me back with a bunch of scrap um, loom pieces that he had done. So he kind of gave me those and he was like, do whatever you want with this. And I was like, I'm gonna incorporate this into my next collection. you know. So that's what I did. And those pieces were made out of wool, um, Sea Island cotton, which is a very rare cotton, things like that. So I incorporated that into the collection. It was like, I can't put this on polyester. Like this is so natural and the level is here. You know, I didn't want to cheapen it. So I was like, I'm going to stick with doing it with the cottons. Um, like I said, the light cell, the linen, the wools, that kind of thing. So that's what I did. So that was the start of how I got into only using the natural materials, right? Um, in the midst of creating the collection, I was going through a lot, but I was also doing a lot of the research. So that's what pulled me in. Um, and then I would just say that, so on the research side, I don't wanna bore you, but I'll go into it a little bit about what I found and like the research that people did that kind of like led me that way. Um, so in 2003, there was a study that was done by um, a doctor who was testing the frequencies of fabric. And he found that the human body, the healthy human body um, at its optimal health has a frequency of 100, right? Um, 100 is also the same registered vibrational frequency as organic cotton. So there are machines that engineers and agriculture environmentalists use to test um, like their, you know, their crops prior to doing whatever they have to do for the season. Um, and there is a machine called an Ag and Venron machine that was used to do this as well. Um, and it was initially created to analyze the signature frequencies of agricultural commodities to aid the farmers in determining the right time of harvest growth. So I, isn't that interesting? So that's, that was the initial start of it. But of course, linen comes from the flax plant. So it's natural. So it kind of happened, I guess, by mistake in a way where they ended up finding out that the frequency of linen is 5,000. So linen and wool both have a frequency of 5,000 and they're considered super fabrics because of this. Um, and when you wear the fabrics that have the higher vibrational frequencies, they raise your body's natural frequency. So what it ends up doing is um, having a healing, calming and soothing effect. And what ends up happening is you might, you know, it, it's better for your skin, um, it's better for you to sleep on these fabrics um, and just better for you to just have them in your environment and on your body, at, you know, throughout the day. Polyester has a lower frequency. I believe polyester is um, anywhere from like 15 to 45 frequency. 
And when the human body is sick or diseased, it's usually at a frequency of about 15 to 20. So that's when a, a body registers low frequency and when it's like close, I wouldn't say close to death. Um, but so that, that research is what led me to go deeper into it. And then I started to think about so many other things. Like, I'll just give you a few other facts. Um, they were talking about how uh, a physician, um, so the existence of the energy using the plant leaves, that's how they figured it out, right? Using the oscilloscope, which is another machine that they use to test it. So one of the physicians discovered that flax glob acts as an antenna for the energy. He found that when pure flax glob was put over a wound or local pain, it greatly accelerated the healing process. He also used the cloth as an antenna for his oscilloscope. So to sort of like balance the frequencies and vibrations. So it's not like some like random things that I'm like, you know, coming up with and making up. It's actually things that have been tested by scientists, um, by agriculturalists, farmers, that kind of thing. So it's already been happening like years ago. It's just that people haven't really been talking about it as much, right? And um, around like the 1950s is when polyester was introduced to the United States. And then it got really, really popular in the 70s. <laughs> and so in fashion a lot, you'll see that all throughout the 70s, people were wearing polyester because it was marketed as like this miracle fabric that you can wear up to 68 times without having to iron because it won't wrinkle. But then the downside of it was that it wasn't as breathable. It wasn't as comfortable on the skin. So after a while, you might get some irritation. Um, like, you know, people were wearing this to parties, they were wearing it all day, they were hot, it was causing like breakouts on the skin, that kind of thing. So a lot of people were starting to miss cotton and linen because of it and wool, um, which is also, like I said, a super fabric. Wool is super breathable. A lot of people don't know this, but merino wool in particular, you can wear it throughout many seasons. You just have to find a lighter weight. Um, the same with linen, they have heavier, heavier weights of linen, like not all linen is that super like flowy linen that we see in the summertime. Um, some linens are as heavy as denim and people don't know this, of course, but this is something that's out there. And if you want to wear it throughout the seasons, that's something to kind of look into and, you know, get familiar with. But so anyway, all that's to say, it's important to consider this because you spend a lot of time in your bed, right? Um, you know, we're supposed to get eight hours of sleep. So if you're laying on sheets that are not, um, higher thread counts and not, you know, made of natural materials, this is where your body is supposed to be recharging, we're supposed to be sort of resting so that it can be doing whatever it needs to do internally with its organs. So if you're not providing it um, a clean and like, you know, vibrationally sound environment to do that in, then you're not really helping as much as you could be. You could maximize it by sleeping on organic cotton, cotton or linen. I would say maybe not wool sheets because I don't, I've never really experienced seeing wool sheets and ever sleeping on them and them being comfortable. But I think you would do fine to just do organic cotton, cotton or linen, um, just as a suggestion. Um, and so, yeah, that that's definitely what I wanted to share with y'all. But I also wanted to share a video. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Because I think it would be good to talk about that real quick. Um, y'all bear me in one second, just give me one second. I'm trying to see the thing where you like share the screen. Is there, is there a safe way to get wool without hurting the animals? So they're working on that. Um, I have started to stay away from it for that reason and started to lean more towards just the cotton, organic cotton and linen. Um, but a lot of things, as you know, are starting to happen in labs now, and they're trying to find ways to maximize whatever the fibers are and kind of like recreate them so that they're not taking it from um, like live animals. But in a way, when you think about it, it's attached to a live living thing, you know, so I, I don't really, I haven't really been dealing with the wool thing like that. <laughs> But that's a great question to ask because that was something that came up in my research and I was like, man, wool is like this super frequency fiber fabric thing, but like, I don't really like the process of how it gets done. So I started to go more into like the linens and that's why I started to get into the different weights that linen has. Cause I'm like, well, can you wear linen throughout different seasons? Is there like a winter linen um, for autumn, whatever, not just summertime. And that's when I found the heavier weights. Like I said, the denims, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Oh, I see another question. Saw your work in Refashion Week as a designer. I was a stylist for the event. 
and have just started transitioning to natural dye work over synthetic colors in my practice. Oh, on Oh, cool. That's the stuff. I like to hear that. That makes me happy. Yes, I remember you. You're amazing. Hi. <laughs> um, the business partner of Fallon. I'm going to say, oh, very excited. Welcome. All right, y'all. I'm trying to share my screen because I want to show y'all this video. If anybody has the um, the understanding of how to do that, let me know so I can move a little faster for y'all. On the bottom of the screen, um, there's the green button with <laughs> I'm the arrow pointing up. Crazy, I see it now. <laughs> okay, and now I just do. Oh, desktop. And then if you're sharing sound from the video, uh, make sure you click the box that says like share computer sound. Okay. okay. Oh, I have to grant access. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Um, you gonna let me do it? Um, Click the lock to make changes. There we go. Screen integrity support building. Um, Oh, okay, it's just saying it won't be able to, okay. So let's see, I should be able to do it now. Let's try it again. I appreciate y'all's patience. Um, yeah, that's the one. So this is just where I'm talking about um, that first collection on mission that I did where I only, I see my screen, hit me with a thumbs up if you can. Okay, perfect. Here we go. So the fabric that was predominantly used throughout this collection is linen. Um, and linen is actually a healing fiber. It reflects light. Um, and it actually has a vibrational frequency of 5,000, which is considered extremely high for fabrics. Um, the flax plant, which the linen derives from, is where this comes from. And it's really interesting because 50 is considered chronic disease or like when the body is unwell. So you have to think to other threads and other fabrics like cottons and like silks and um, just like hemp and their vibrational frequency is no more than like 40, 60 and like 100. So when you compare that to linen, which is 5000, that just lets you know, like if you're wearing like linen clothing or if you sleep on linen bedding, then you know that that's it's, it's not just looking good on your body but it's also healing you as you wear it. And it was important for me to create clothes that do more than just look good. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think this was the route. Um, we know that there's this big sustainability movement. I'm gonna get to that. Okay, so <laughs> I wanted to just share that with y'all to show y'all the, um, what is it? Just sort of like the, I wanna say the, the nuts and the bolts behind that collection I was explaining to you. That's kind of where that started and where the idea came from, and then the you know the happening of it, the the bringing to life of the idea. Um, but yeah, so that was how that went. That was obviously right after the pandemic. So one thing that I realized immediately after doing that collection though was how expensive natural fibers were. Um, coming from a background of like I said, initially designing with whatever I could get my hands on, I was obviously using polyester, obviously using whatever was cheap. I would go in the fabric store and if something was a $1.99 per yard, I was buying it and using it. Um, and then I, of course, when I visited the island of Barbados, that changed for me. So I wanted to come back and really do intentional work. And I was like, I don't wanna just make clothes just because I can make clothes. I wanna make clothes that heal people's bodies as they wear them and they do more for people as they wear them. You know, I feel like so many of us just need healing. And I feel like we always isolate healing to just like, medical or whatever the case may be, but it, it goes into so many other aspects of our lives in so many realms, right? So I figured why not with fashion? Um, and I ended up realizing, I'm like, this is so expensive. It was like almost like 15, $20 a yard for fabric, for linen, you know? And this is me trying to source it 
ethically from people who are like doing the work, doing the things that are supposed to do. And it's like, I understand why it's so expensive because if you've ever watched a video on how they turn the fiber into fabric, it's work. Like it's, it's work. Like you're, you're busting, you're breaking a sweat. So you, you can't really say that it's fair to charge less for that. Right. And I think in America, we're also very used to paying like cents on a dollar for like serious labor. Right. So that's something we're privileged and accustomed to, because like I say, you go somewhere else and you're realizing like these people who are doing this work for us and then it's getting imported are not getting paid anywhere close to what the people who have these bigger companies and corporations are getting paid, right? So I had one of those moments where I was like, I need to remove myself from this process until I can really understand more of whatever my actual footprint is in the, in the scheme of things, but also do it in a way where I can still feel good about what my practice is, right? Um, and so what ended up happening was I just went back to what little me used to do, which was take a sock and turn it into a dress, right? <laughs> or go and take the clothing bag that was about to be donated and see if I can take anything and salvage it from that. So being what I consider just resourceful. Um, and so that was initially how I got into this. And I was doing this not knowing that people were calling it something. And as you know, it's, it's called sustainable fashion, right? And I didn't know that that was the term for it. I just had been doing this. And then I didn't know until I spoke to a friend of mine who has a thrift store. Um, and she's been doing this whole thing where she goes and she does like thrift flips and then she sells them. But now she's a little more intentional with it where she's turning them into clothing. She's doing different things with it. But when she first started out, it was like, okay, I'm going to thrift and I'm grabbing like a bunch of things from thrift and then reselling it. And I would see her use terms like sustainable, eco, like things like that. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> And so um, the deeper I got into my practice, the more I started to understand, okay, they've carved out this lane in fashion and this is what they're calling this genre or you know, this subgroup. Now, my only thing was that I did feel like the representation was lacking in that space. And I did start to see as I would go to these events or network or try to schmooze with other people in my industry that a lot of people didn't look like me, right? And I was just like, this, this is, doesn't make sense because a lot of the origins of sustainability just come from indigenous black and Latinx people being resourceful. And I was like, why are we being excluded from what's happening right now? And why is this, this whole movement that's like quiet right now in the tuck, but we know it's about to like completely change the game and take over so many things. Cause there's policies being changed now at this point. Like we don't even use plastic bags anymore, <laughs> but it's like, you're not seeing places where people look like us are there, you know? And so that bothered me. Um, and so I kind of was like, I need to do this in a way where I'm not only still able to put out my craft and be, be an artist in my own way, but also create a space for more people. Um, so I started a mentorship program where I wanted to teach the youth how to sew, but in a way where I wasn't just going like, oh, this is the only thing I'm gonna teach you. I was like talking to them about the process, talking to them about entrepreneurship, monetizing art, things like that. And then I started to do the workshops where I talk more about sustainability and um, you know, the vibrational frequencies and the healing fabrics that exist. Because a lot of the times I was doing these community workshops, people would kind of pull me aside and go like, well, cotton sheets are expensive or you know, linen is expensive or whatever the case may be. And I'm just like, yeah, it is. But when you go to thrift stores, start curating your shopping. Like when you go to a Goodwill or a Salvation Army, it's easy to just pick up something because it's cute, right? Or because you like it, you like the jacket, you like this, whatever. But I always encourage people now, I'm like, flip the tag, flip the label and read its contents before you purchase it. Because you can actually find some really good quality stuff in those stores. Like you can find things that are 100% cotton, 100% linen, 100% wool, 100% organic cotton. And the great thing about it is that um, it lasts longer in your closet. The quality of it is much better. And it, it does something for your skin and your body as you wear it, right? Um, so that was just kind of my way of breaking into that whole sphere and then trying to change the way things are happening. Um, it's obviously going to take time, but I'm building up to, you know, continue to work on that. But not to get too far away from obviously talking about the research, I'm going to come back in and just see if you guys have um, any questions that I've been missing too. Okay, no. <laughs> I see somebody said, um, I received the information in the workshop. Oh, okay. Welcome everybody. I'm just now reading some of the people coming in. Um, like I said, if y'all have questions, feel free to drop them in there. Um, somebody mentioned towels. <clears throat> yes. 
cotton towels. Yeah, because a lot of the towels are made out of polyester now, as you see that, or they're blends. And it's just like, flip the tag. I always tell people, I'm like, flip the label, flip the tag. All day long when I shop, that's what I do. I like 100% will stand there and read the contents. The same way I do in the grocery stores. I read contents. I sit there and I read. I'm that person in the aisle who's staring at a box for five minutes, reading that whole paragraph. I'm like, what is that? Number four. Oh, no, I don't need that. <laughs> like, so that's, that's what I encourage people to do. Um, how good is cashmere on the body? Oh, cashmere is, so uh, with wools, there's different types of wools, right? And a lot of times they name, they're name named based on where the region that the animal is from um, or the company who has like that patent or like ownership of whatever the fabric or fiber is, but they're all derived from a type of wool. Um, but so the actual wool and stuff like the cashmere and all of that stuff on your body is just a softer wool. Um, and the interesting, about, interesting thing about wool so this is gonna freak some of y'all out a little bit, but okay, I had to share this because this was a part of the research that really, really, really made me raise my eyebrows. Um, I need to get to this part. These are my notes, y'all. I research this often, <laughs> but um, there's there's a part of the research that really sticks out to me where they talk about. I think it's here. Yes, it is. Okay, so linen fibers reflect light, which we talked about, right? Flax thread is the only natural material used for internal stitching in surgical settings. This is because at the electronic cellular level, flax cells are highly complementary with human cells. The human cells can completely dissolve a flax cell without any harm to the body. Isn't that incredible? So like, <laughs> so flax, the flax plant, the way the molecular structure of it is derived is really, really, really similar to our molecular structure. So like when it does this, it doesn't harm us. It just kind of like can just, sort of you know do this in our bodies without hurting us so like they explained in the research they use it a lot um, in surgical settings and the funny thing about it is you would put a piece of linen cloth on a on a scar to speed up the healing right because it's similar to the skin it's similar to the cells in the body wool is most similar to our hair and i know a lot of y'all are like oh, like you might have heard some references about wool and stuff like that and like of course like um religious text that kind of thing but um the way the, the wool is um, made up is very similar to our hair. So I always tell people, if you get a wool sweater and it's itchy or scratchy, soak it in some kind of um, conditioner or something like a mixture or solution of conditioner and water to soften it because the hairs will soften, like that's all it is. And then if you have a wool sweater and um, it ends up getting itchy or scratchy after you wash it, it's just because the harshness of the chemicals and whatever you washed it with did that to the wool. So consider that. Um, and then if you have, a wool sweater and you wash it and it gets holes in it afterwards, it's because um, the enzymes ate at the actual wool. So it's things like that, you know, just, just wanted to put that out there. Um, are you vegan plant-based? I am. I'm going on, I think 11 years. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, this has been my life. So it's not just in fashion, it's like my entire life. I like do research for everything and I usually use myself as the tester. <laughs> um, so it's foolproof research on all sides. But so I wanted to talk to y'all about that. Another thing that I've known too is that, um, so flax is actually resistant to fungus and bacteria um, and it can be an effective barrier to some diseases, which again goes into the whole healing thing. Um, silica that's present in the flax fiber protects linen against rotting, which is why historically the preserved mummies of Egyptian pharaohs were wrapped in linen cloth. So you know how everybody does the Halloween costumes where they like wrap themselves, whatever, whatever, it was linen. So that's why when they find and unfortunately dig up those graves and those tombstones, that's what they see is linen cloth. And that's why the linen is still preserved on the body because linen, it, it just, you know, it stays there. Um, when it's not, you know what I mean? When it's not interrupted with anything else or any chemicals are treated, it, it just preserves itself. Um, and, you know, I already, I said linen contains a vibrational frequency of 5,000. Um, this is why wearing linen and having linen bedding would have a healing qualitative significance uh, greater than that of hemp, cotton, and silk, uh, which only states at 40, 80, and 100. So hemp has a, a frequency of 40. Cause I know a lot of people are starting to like look into hemp fibers cause it is popular. Um, silk has a frequency of 80 and cotton of hundred. Um, organic cotton is 150. So it's higher. 
And um, like I said, linen and wool is 5,000. Polyester is much lower. It's usually 50 and lower for polyester. And another thing that I have to talk about is that a lot of these fibers are considered biodegradable, but the only thing is that there's a catch with it. If you wanna decompose or use the fibers in that way, it can't be dyed. Otherwise, it'll slow the process of it biodegrading into your soil. Um, and you, of course, want to remove any notions. So if there's buttons, zippers, that kind of thing, it has to kind of be like just, you know, just whatever the actual fiber, the t-shirt, tank top, whatever it is, and you put it with your um, compost. But it usually can decompose under ideal soil conditions anywhere from, I think, two to five months, which is exciting because polyester, that don't happen with polyester. <laughs> Polyester usually takes, they say years, like, or it just doesn't, and it just stays wherever it is. So if it's in the ocean, it's in the ocean. Jackson, hi. Mm -hmm. You know what? Oh, I thought somebody was asking a question. <laughs> um, what do you think about hemp? Um, I think hemp is, is one of those fibers that is cool that we're kind of like starting to go into more natural fibers. I'm all for it. I really enjoy and appreciate that. Um, and it has healing qualities too. I haven't done as much research about it, so I'm not going to pretend like I know like a bunch of stuff about it. But um, like I know about hemp, probably what you know about hemp. <laughs> but they, they talk about it in fashion. So I just thought, okay, let me look up whatever. Because I looked up the vibrational frequency of all those fibers. Because I'm like, if somebody's tested these, I want to know. And I found an abstract from a doctor who had done the research. So I started getting into it, um, which is essentially what I'm about to start doing soon for myself. I'm going to start to um, document myself doing research so that I can kind of start to share it and talk to more people about it. And just more people need to know about it, you know. Um, and just to give y'all a, a drop of information, because I started to think about so many things. I was like, what if we start, uh, what if we start making like all the bedding and this and that in hospitals out of organic cotton? And what if like um, sanitary napkins are made out of linen and like all this stuff? And then I went to go Google and research like if somebody had made linen, linen sanitary napkins and the person was on Etsy selling them, right? And I was this close to buying it. I like cache the link to go back to it. And then a year later, I go back to it. And they had some like notice saying that like the FDA shut them down. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that just tells you, you know, it's like when you start to do that research and you see things like that, you're like, I think I'm going the right direction. <laughs> it doesn't scare me. So yeah, that's how I'm looking at that. Um, and another thing that I really want to do is start to remind people, especially people in the fashion industry, like we wouldn't have a fashion industry if it wasn't for like the farmers. So it's like, let's start to kind of reconnect to that, that, you know, what that relationship was. Cause it was like, of course, a lot of people are not going to sit at a loom and actually weave the fabric, weave the fibers, create the thread, um, create the yarn and then create the fabric, but it would be good to show people the origins of how things happen so that they can start to have more of an appreciation. Because I think a lot of people frown their noses up at paying $40, $50 for a t-shirt, but want to do $2 for a t-shirt. But it's like, you want to do $2 for a t-shirt, but are you understanding why your t-shirt is $2, you know? And it's like, I think with that education being added into it, people will start to really understand. And not saying they'll pay $50 for a t-shirt, but maybe they'll go, well, I can afford $50 for a t-shirt, but maybe I'll go take this sewing class on how to make my own t-shirt. And so that's why I do things like offer sewing classes, stuff like that. Cause I'm like, yeah, you can tell me my stuff is too expensive and that's fine, but it's quality, it's ethical, <laughs> it's handmade with these two hands. You know what I mean? I'm like, nobody's harmed in the process. Um, it doesn't use a lot of water or any natural resources that's like harming the environment. But if this is not in your budget, I respect and understand that here's this class. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, give people options. That's how I look at it. Because a lot of the articles circulating about the sustainable fashion industry right now are saying how people are complaining about the prices. And I'm like, I knew that would happen because designers can't go down on their prices based on how expensive it is to source the materials. But my thing is designers can do things like have partnerships and deals with like the Salvation Armies, the Goodwills, um, the thrift stores, where maybe we get the damaged things that have stains and holes and stuff like that. And then we turn those things into clothing for like the communities, you know? Uh, obviously it's gonna take some legwork and some time to get to that point, but that's just, you know, where my brain goes when I think about what we could do once everybody's educated about what's happening and like 
just more self-aware, more conscious of what they're doing in the environment, that kind of thing. Um, so what is Egyptian cotton is the finest quality cotton. I hear you, yes. <laughs> um, does it take time for natural dyes to break down too? Yeah, I mean, so natural dyes, I would, I would, I would assume no, because, okay, because the synthetic ones are what causes the harm and what slows the process. So if you're using, like say echinacea, for example, to dye something, echinacea is a plant, it's plant derived. So my assumption is that that wouldn't harm the soil or the earth. You know what I mean? It would be fine. So I feel like you'd be good there, which I think is why my stylist friend um, up there says something about that. Yeah, Hanji said, I'm, I'm using the natural dyes and stuff. Maybe Hanji can speak to that a little bit more, but exactly. Um, what do you use to dye? Well, I haven't started to do that yet. That's something I want to get into. Um, I actually wanted to, because I did some research on denims and I was like, I wanted to use denim, but I was like, I don't really like the racial history associated with denim and a lot of people don't know about it, but there's this really good documentary on PBS that they did where they talked about the history of denim, um, dungarees, jeans, whatever you want to call them. And they got into why the fabric is blue. And a lot of people don't know this, but it's from the indigo plant, the indigo ferro plant. Um, and so we, as in, you know, African people were the only ones who knew how to maneuver the plant to turn it from that green to that blue. It was like a practice that we had and we brought with us and we were doing in slavery, of course, enslaved. So that to me didn't sit right with me and I didn't wanna just jump into the world of denim without doing it thoughtfully. So I'm taking my time with that and also thinking maybe I can go and study how to do the dye myself. Maybe I can go and get natural denim in its natural state and then do that on my own so that I, I kind of have more of that connection to it. Um, but I'm getting into that. But yeah, that that's something I'm gonna look into. And then of course, I'm gonna start to play around with more dyes because if I can get my hands on more organic cotton sourced directly from those farmers, then I'll have that space and that time and that ability to go, okay, I'm gonna take these onion peels and I'm gonna take um, these like avocado seeds and all whatever and start to do my own coloring and stuff like that because that's definitely the next step for me what i'm going to do that'll be the upgrade um it will probably be even more nutritional for the soil exactly blue is not a real color so there is nothing natural in nature that makes it blue i learned that's real i believe that yeah the indigo i'm like they they literally i saw the video but they're like mixing it over this is the this steaming pot where they like several times putting the denim in there with the indigo ferra and the indigo fair like eventually turns to that like bluish hue. Um, oh, the oxi the oxidization, that's what does it. Cause it's green, yeah, and then it turns to the blue. And then that's what happens and how you get the denims and all the different, you know, the natural way that they did it. Um, yes, what is that? Oh, that's the PBS org. Yes, y'all should watch that, it's really interesting. Um, denim is very bad for the environment. We don't need more denim. I take on denim is to only upcycle it. So like take the ones that's already out there, yeah. Which is how I design anyway. And I always encourage people to do that too. I'm like, the most sustainable thing to do is wear what's already in your closet. <laughs> but if you don't, you know, if you wanna go out and get something, then obviously go and, you know, go to a thrift store, go wherever, where something is already made. Um, even with sourcing stuff, I encourage people, I'm like, source from what's already made. Um, you use less, you get more like, you know what I mean? Like you get to play with more things that are already done, already out there. You're not adding more damage on top of the damage that's already been done. So I agree with Fallon on that. Um, I think Hanji just put a link in for collections, natural dyes, check that out. Thank you for sharing that. It's the highest production of water waste and ocean pollution, correct? Yeah, I just read something about that too. Um, but yeah, so, and I was thinking about something else I wanted to share with y'all. I got three sets of notes open, don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, I was talking about like ways to continue being sustainable. Um, one of them, I do this workshop where I teach people, I actually, collaborated with, I think they're in here. Oh wait, maybe they're in here, Deja. Um, I correct, I collaborated with Deja um, from Black Brand and um, we did a workshop. She, uh, Deja was doing like a camp, a sustainable like summer fashion camp. And we did a workshop where the participants turned t-shirts like old t-shirts into tote bags. 
which is one that I really like to do. I did it in East New York Farms before too. It was super hot that day. So a lot of people did not come. I didn't blame them, <laughs> um, but we turned the t-shirts into tote bags. Um, it was no sew and all you literally used was a pair of scissors. So things like that, I encourage people to do because I'm like, that's something that you're going to always have. You could take that when you go to the market, when you travel, like when you're just running around outside, like whatever you need to do. But that way it's from something that you already own. You're not going out and buying something new. Um, and then you can even take the scraps, for example, like the sleeves from the t-shirt, create like a scrunchie, a headband, like so many things with that, you know? So that's, that's something I do with people at that workshop. Uh, and then just getting more into it. Like I said, I teach people more about the fabrics thing, because like I said, the more, you know, it's like you start to care a little bit more and become more self-aware. Um, but yeah, I feel like I would like to allow y'all to ask any questions or like share, if you have anything to say that you want to say about it, like drop it in the chat or do the thing where you like raise your hand so that it tells you. Um, but that was the gist of things for the sustainability, the fabric healing. I'm trying to make sure I cover everything. <laughs> and I know it's not the seven o'clock mark yet, but I was trying to leave some room for just like genuine com like general conversation. Um, Cause this is definitely something I could just keep talking about. I'm very passionate about this. The notes are like crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, do y'all wanna hear some more to research? Oh, somebody's raising their hand, okay. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Tony, hi. Hi, all right, I'm driving, but I just wanna um, say, I wanna touch on when you talked about um, you thinking that it's more sustainable when it comes to buying what's already out there versus like having it made. And I, I kinda wanted to ask, why do you feel that way? Um, especially if you're starting a brand, like you usually want to start with like new material or at least source out like a linen or something that's fresh and that you could just make your own if you're selling um, multiple units of that garment. So like, would you still consider it sustainable if a person was to find, you know, um, I guess natural fiber fabric at a decent cost? rather than just grab what's on the market already if you if that makes sense like I, I feel like all i'm trying to get is that like we don't want to create waste right and um i guess some people have their own definition of what is sustainable or not like if you grab things on the market do you how do you feel like that's more sustainable mm -hmm. than starting like fresh so I think that there is definitely two layers to it. Um, okay. One thing is that in the sustainability world, it's still a wild, wild west kind of in a way where a lot of people haven't quite defined what it means to be sustainable and what it doesn't mean, right? Right. At the same time, it's like fashion is one of the biggest contributors to waste right now, right? And it's like, we need to wear clothes, but do we need to wear new clothes all the time, right? And yeah. The second level of that is that I understand and I sympathize with being a designer and like, I wanna give my clients and my customers new things and nice things, but also when I'm sourcing things, if I have an idea, won't mm -hmm. it limit me if I'm going and only picking from certain things? So that's why it comes in where I kind of encourage and challenge designers to like, try to step outside the thinking of like doing things the way that we've been doing it. So like collections, right? Seasonal collections, right. not sustainable. Um, cause you think about how much stuff doesn't get bought up and how much stuff doesn't get used, but then yeah. in the process of making it, we think about how many natural resources and materials we deplete in the process of doing it. And then for what, cause a lot of it doesn't even get purchased, you know? So if you sell out, that's great. But also I'm like, start to think about different ways we can do things and type, like break down these systems that have kind of been in place because they've not been like contributing or helping the planet or environment, you know? So like there's ways around it. We just have to become more like um, creative and more resourceful to do it. So if you want to do a linen collection, maybe go to a thrift store and get 2XL, 3XL men's linen shirts. You know, right. what I mean? because then you have this really big stretch of fabric that you can use and do things with versus going and getting it on a boat, you know? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Like just break, having a new system of doing things rather than, you know, follow the traditional way. 
that yeah, makes like, sense that's great, more sustainable great. okay yeah, like, try something new like check it out if it doesn't work for you fine but like at least try it out and see like is there a way i can do this that doesn't involve the production process because we also know a lot of the production process is shady you know what i mean so it's like yeah again we're far removed and that's a privilege but imagine actually going to the factories that we're like doing this business with quote unquote and seeing what their conditions are like. I think that would change a lot of how we do things like great. Yeah. You can get 50 sweatshirts for whatever the price is that they're giving you, but like who's making the sweatshirts, how are they being treated? Where are they coming from? Like, what are these people yeah. being paid? Like, you know what I mean? Like, also, how are the, the items being treated? Like, as in like, what are they doing chemically to the clothing before it's sent in whatever the case may be? There's so many different layers of it, you know? So like breaking down the actual systems and the steps it takes to get there, like for sure will like help to kind of like push that creativity and like kind of wonder more about it, you know? Yeah, I agree. I, I totally agree on that. And it opened my eyes up as well because it's like, I've always heard that and I'm just like, well, how can I go? Like, I know how to go about it, but you know, I'm growing up in this world nowadays. A lot of things are, you're getting it from the fabric store and we're used to just yeah. having new fabric, you know? Um, yeah. So it's a good way to think of how to limit just even the production of that and just recycling and reusing what is currently out there on a consistent basis. Exactly. Thank, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I saw two more hands. If y'all have questions, feel free to put your hands up. If not, it's okay too. Um, but yeah, that was a really I good I think point. Rose has uh, their hand up. Yeah, hi. Oh, yeah. Hi, Rose. Hi, I just wanted to play off of that. I think it's so, that was such a great, um, you know, conversation about the word sustainability and what that even means. And I think it's really important for us to remember that this is the wild, wild west, like right now. And it's like, we have so much power for those words because it does come back to the process, you know, or it could, like, that's just one option for sustainability. So I don't think there's like a right or wrong, but I think, it, think it's also looking at like what we define as waste and then kind of tackling it from there because like you said, the fashion industry is one of the most, if not the most wasteful. And I personally think there's already so much out there that we like kind of need to use. Yeah. So, but it's so exciting to as well have new and use and having new that's made in a new way, so. Yeah, and I wouldn't be honest if I didn't talk about like the constant internal struggle that I have as a designer, like knowing that this industry contributes so much to it, you know what I mean? It's like always, also me being the artist that I am, like that's how I express my art, right? It's like by creating, but I also know like, I can't just keep giving, putting stuff out, putting stuff out. It's like, why? Like, why do I need to keep doing it? That's just things in excess for what? Um, but at the same time, I'm like, if I'm going to do this until I figure out other things or whatever, like, let me do this in the most sustainable way I can think of or the most resourceful way I can think of, you know? And that's why I was just like, I went back to what little me used to do, just going to those thrift stores, figuring it out, cutting things up, tying it, safety pinning it, like, you know, like, and just, just getting like creative with it. But like I said, I wanted to figure out a way to give other people options and, and ways to learn about it too. So that's why I started doing the workshops and teaching the sewing and like going into the schools. And I created a curriculum um, when I was at Harlem Children's Zone where I taught fashion and sewing, but the entire curriculum was sustainable. And they didn't even know that it was based on sustainability. And it's so funny because like years later I have students and they're like, Ms. Dia, you had us doing sustainable fashion and, and we wasn't even, I was like, I know, <laughs> isn't that great? Like, and they're like, now they're, this is a thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's incredible. Cause it's like, we were already doing that but we didn't know that it was a thing that we were gonna call it or that like, you were gonna start to see these big corporations doing like collaborations with smaller designers or trying to figure out what to do with their waste like stuff like that. So that's kind of something that um, I think about. And that's why, like I said, I'm starting to get more into I want to get more into the nature and the science of it. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, that's really where I'm starting to realize that a lot of my passion is. Like, I, I enjoy creating, I enjoy making, but I can do that for friends and family. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> obviously, I got to eat, but <laughs> if I can figure out ways to do those things in ways where I'm not just um, 
adding to the excess, then I'm cool with that, you know, but I'm also just like, I want to do the research, but I want to document it so people can go, oh, this is a thing, like this exists, it's out there. Because I looked up those people who had done the research and I just can't find anything else about them. And I'm just like, they just fell off, I guess. Like, you know, they didn't do anything with the information or maybe they did, dun, dun, dun. But <laughs> I don't control that, you know, it's just like, this is what I'm doing and I'm out here like figuring it out. Um, but yeah, I, I like that y'all are asking the questions like this is a judge free zone, like feel free to say what's on your mind. Like if you have questions about things that I can answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, I'll also tell you I don't know the answer. And if I can direct you to a resource, I'll do that too. Um, because we're all learning here still, you know. But I do thank all y'all for joining me and like just listening to this and like wanting to share this this conversation and build on this, you know. Yes. Hello, how are you? I'm well. Thank how you. Are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for all of this information. Um, I have a um, specific question about um, like, like buttons and threads and zippers and stuff, because when I've been doing the research, a lot of that, those materials are not sustainable. You know, I know you have to, um, when you said remove them to compost, but that you know what what do you use kind of to make it just like because if they keep making those plastic buttons it's a bad thing as well it's like what are you using for zippers buttons thread which is like crazy that it's like so many things to think about i know it just keeps <laughs> going <laughs> I love that you asked that question because that's where I, I'm at right now in my process a lot of people have been like you haven't put anything out I'm like y'all have no idea the turmoil the internal turmoil that I'm going through like I'm trying to figure out the best way to just get better every time because you learn the information and you can't unlearn it once you know it you know I'm like I'm not going to backtrack and give you all this thing that you know so my older stuff you're going to see zippers and this and that but like the newer things i want to put out i'm starting to go towards saying like how can i add elastic to this waistband without adding elastic to this waistband and like so i'll give you an example a pair of joggers i want to make right so for the waist i'm like i'll do just the regular fold over waist and then i'll do um i'll top stitch two stitches along the waist right so then that way you have like that space in between you know where you would pull the drawstring through and instead of pulling elastic or a drawstring through, I'm just gonna fold over um, a longer strip of fabric and pull that through and see if I can get that same drawstring effect with it. So then that way the entire garment is cotton. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm looking at things like that or- um, So it's in the technique too. Exactly. So I'm like just practicing, trying to do things like that. Another thing I started to think about was um, making the clothing bigger. <laughs> I'm like, everything doesn't have to be all tied up, you know, it's like make something a little bit looser so that I can fit more than one body type or do that and then add like two strings, like a string on this side and a string on that side. So if somebody wants to adjust the waist, they can do it internally and tie it inside, you know what I mean? And that way it cinches the waist, but then it doesn't alter the original size of the product if you still want it to be like bigger, smaller, whatever. So just, just trying to, like I said, again, it's really pushing that creative envelope and trying to get better at that. Reusing the zippers and buttons from thrifting could be useful, definitely, which is something I also do right now. I usually do it that way because I'm not technically taught. So something I've always struggled with is in inserting zippers and buttons and things like that. Not buttons, because I can hand stitch some, but like zippers, doing all that stuff, I've never really had like technical training to do that. So a lot of times when you've seen a zipper, it was because I took it from something that already existed. So of course that's the way, but I think a lot of what Fallon was asking about was when it comes time to like discard of or get rid of a thing, you have all these notions just sitting around. got the buttons, the zippers, the snaps, you know what I mean? All that stuff. And it's like, what do I do with this? This isn't going in my compost. So yeah. Um, but then there's like places like materials for the arts, I think who might take donations so you can like send the stuff there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're trying to find more and more creative ways to do more with that kind of stuff. Cause now it's like, we have all of this stuff now it's great that everybody's getting into the sustainable fashion space and getting into the thinking of how do I do less with more, but what do we do with everything that's already happened, like all the damage that's been done and all the stuff we put out, right? So I think that's the next step to figuring out the best way to get rid of it or recycle it, you know? Thank you for asking that question. That was a good question. Thank you very much. I was gonna say, I think we are nearing 
the close. If anybody has any more questions, let me know. Um, but I've enjoyed this time with y'all and uh, things that I have going on, I can share with you. Uh, one is obviously the research. I'm looking to get into that. Um, it was fun, right? Thank you. <laughs> you you rock. Uh, <laughs> yes, I like I like doing East New York farms. Um, y'all are a community. I say that all the time. Like y'all welcome me with open arms when I was living in um, Brownsville. So yes, I'm always going like, y'all be holding it down. I got y'all. Um, thank you, Iva. But so things that I'm working on, I'm working right now. I'm currently actually part time. Like I'm a lot of people think I'm full time designing and I'm not. <laughs> I'm still working a job and also doing this. The job that I'm doing, um, fortunately, is still in the realm of what I'm interested in doing. Right now, I'm the training operations manager at a sustainable fashion tech startup. They're based in Brooklyn. And what they're trying to do initially when they started, they were trying to revolutionize the way people get tailoring done. So instead of having to like leave the house and go to the tailor, it's like you could do a virtual fit with someone. They send you like this sticker package thing where say you want to get a pair of pants hemmed you would you know stick the sticker on the side and like mark where you want it done and then send it back in and they send you the packaging everything is done that way um and that's how it works but so they're now moving into the space of working with other companies to take their damaged items and like fix them like tailor and like you know clean them up or whatever because it's like you think about companies like nike how many warmups do they have where the zipper is a little janky so they didn't put it out on the floor? You know, so stuff like that. And the, the company I'm with now, they're trying to take things like that, say we can fix the zipper, we can put it back out on the floor and sell it. You know what I mean? And maybe sell it at a discounted rate at that. So that's what they're doing. And then the next step in the next phase is going to be upcycling, which is what I do. Um, so I'll be working with them to sort of figure out what it looks like to start collaborating with more of these bigger brands and stuff to do that kind of thing and do that rollout. Um, and it's great because I, like I said, again, I'm doing what I already do with them. Um, and I have agency to kind of like help them, like, you know, spare them into that, that way of like doing things that way. So I'm consulting and pretty much like teaching them how to get into that space. Um, like I said, it's enjoyable work, but on the other hand, I'm also still doing like my brand and my business stuff. So it's been good with that. And then I'm also still trying to get back into the mentorship and the teaching aspect, but I just want to do everything right. You know, we're here, we have to do everything legally correct. <laughs> so that's been a part of it. Um, I've been gracious enough to have people open up their spaces to me to do teaching, to do workshops, but I would also like to sort of organize the ideas. Like I want to build curriculums. I want to share those curriculums, that kind of thing something I'm working on that Fallon is probably familiar with because this is something I reached out to Fallon originally a long time ago is my Reach the World campaign, the shirt that you're seeing now. Um, and Fallon, I think you'll be happy to hear this, but when I first started, the idea was literally to just make these t-shirts and have people who are in the community like Fallon, they're doing amazing things in their community, um, to wear the shirts while they're doing work. And then I was like, I need to do more with this idea because, you know, I'm a Sag. <laughs> so then I thought through, I thought it through and I was like, um, I want proceeds from the sale to go towards um, community based and black owned schools in inner cities. Um, so not just New Jersey, not just New York, but like Atlanta, Philly, all these places, right? Um, and so the, initially the next step was trying to figure out, okay, what schools? So I did my research and I've composed this list of um, not only community-based learning centers and schools, but also organizations that do things like um, uh, fund transitions for, um, for non-binary like young women and men, like things like that. So I wanted to make sure that I'm, everybody's getting something, you know? So that was the time that I was taking to do that. So I'm building out the Reach the World campaign. Um, I have my list and instead of it just being t-shirts, I'll be releasing um, sets so like um, patchwork, like joggers and like long sleeve shirts, and then it'll have the reach the world embroidered on it. Cause I'm like, if I'm gonna have a product that's gonna be like, like give people something, some sleeves, some pants, like, you know, and let people know that literally a half of the sale is gonna go. Um, and there'll be a drop down for them to choose from the list to choose which school or which um, organization that the proceeds go to. So like I said, I'm working through that, um, getting the paperwork done and then, Fallon will be here for me soon again. <laughs> We're gonna get this back on the road. But um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's something that I'm focusing on. I'm I'm a lot more focused on community stuff right now. I'm like I said again, I always will enjoy creating and making. 
Um, but the thing that's pulling me and pulling my heartstrings is definitely just community and making and understanding like where I fall in the process of things. So that's what people are seeing a lot more of. Um, and opportunities are hitting me. I'm, I'm on Upcycle Nation, which is a show on Fuse TV. They just released the first episode, which is so cool. It's upcyclers who compete, something like Project Runway, but for upcyclers. Um, so this is the first season and thank you everybody who's doing the yes. So my episode airs on the 23rd, um, but yeah, I'll be sharing the links and stuff. So if you follow me on Instagram and stuff, I'll put my little at down here so you can see it. Um, I'll follow you back and you can see the episode. I'll post the thing. Oh, I directed it to Desiree, sorry. <laughs> I just said it to everyone. Uh, you know how tricky this thing is sometimes. I think once somebody types, it does that. Um, this was so great. Enjoyed the workshop. Very interesting, educational. Great job. Thank you. We need these spaces for a sustainable community. We'd love to do more for sure. You're in a thousand. Thank you, Fallon. We, we definitely have to talk. We got to work, y'all. Yeah, we do. Thank you for the information. I learned a lot. I'm glad you need the link. Oh, okay. To the, to the, um, to the Fuse TV thing. Yeah. Oh, matter of fact, can we put it in right now while we're talking about it? So that I don't lose y'all. That's amazing. I will. I need a show like that. <laughs> it's really cool, and you you can watch it. I think online. Um, I don't know if you have to download the app. You know how everything's on streaming services now. <laughs> but I'll I'll just drop the link in here, and y'all do what y'all need to do with it. The first episode is out. I'm not on the show until the 23rd, but I still encourage y'all to watch the episodes because they're just really interesting. And I think it's dope that there's finally a platform for upcycling designers. You know everybody's been doing this for so long like this isn't new like our grandmas was doing this <laughs> like they've been resourceful that's why i'm just like everybody using the word sustainable i'm always like resourceful <laughs> like that's what we're doing we've been doing this so yeah um but yeah i'm working on that and then of course like i said i call what i do fabric alchemy so i'm working to carve that out and make my own lane in the fashion industry with it being that but making it so much more about just other things outside of just being clothes and fashion um but yeah thank you everyone for joining i put my instagram i put the link to the thing and yes i have the quilts Ooh, i want those <laughs> um but so yeah i put everything in the chat i appreciate all y'all who joined um i think it was a great turnout and i'm i want to continue to do more race near farm so alec will be talking <laughs> fallon we're gonna be talking to and anybody else who's in here who wants to connect on things reach out like um i'm always open and down to collaborate on things um that align so thank you all <laughs> thank you so much peace thank you see you later rosie <laughs>